officers, veterans, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We are indeed privileged to have Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon as our next eminent speaker this evening. Mr. Menon was the National Security Advisor of India to Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. Earlier, he had served as the Foreign Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs. He has been the Indian High Commissioner to Pakistan and Sri Lanka and Ambassador to China and Israel. He is currently visiting Professor of International Relations at Ashoka University. He hails from Palakkad uh, district of uh, Kerala and comes from a family of diplomats. His father, P. N. Menon, served as the ambassador to Yugoslavia. His grandfather, K. P. S. Menon, the senior, was India's first foreign secretary, while his uncle, K. P. S. Menon, the junior, was the former Indian ambassador to China and the 15th foreign secretary. His great grandfather, Sir C. Sankaran Nair, was the president of the Indian National Congress in 1897. So a family of luminaries. Mr. Menon did his schooling from Sindhya School, Gwalia. Later did his MA in history from St. Uh, Stephen's College, Delhi. He joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1972. He also served in the Department of Atomic Energy as advisor to the Atomic Energy Commission. His work continued there through to his next posting in Vienna. He's had three postings to Beijing, the last one as ambassador, saw significant Indo, uh, Sino Indian uh, interactions, and the high point being the visit of then Prime Minister Atul Bihari Bajpai in June 2003. This uh, visit witnessed a major breakthrough in bilateral relations. He was the Foreign Secretary from September 2006 to July 2009, and shortly thereafter, he became the fourth National Security Advisor and held the post from January 2010 to May 2014 when the new government came in and uh, the current uh, NSA, Mr. Ajit Dobal, took over. A uh, major milestone of his career was the Indo-US nuclear deal for which he, he had worked hard to convince NSG uh, members uh, along with uh, Mr. Sham Saran to get a clear uh, waiver for nuclear supplies to India. Mr. Menon joined the uh, Brookings Institution, USA, as a distinguished fellow and also serves as the chairman of the advisory board of the Institute of Chinese Studies based in New Delhi. He's been a Fisher Family Fellow at Kennedy School, Harvard University to, uh, in 2015, and Richard uh, Wilhelm Fellow at MIT in 2015. He, he was uh, chosen to be one of the top 100 global thinkers by the Foreign Policy Magazine in 2010. He joined the Institute of uh, South Asian Studies at National University at uh, Singapore as a Distinguished Visiting Fellow in November 2017. And his publications include Choices Inside the Making of India's Foreign Policy 2016, published by Brookings Institute uh, Press and Penguin. Uh, the book is based on his experience as National Security as Advisor. Uh, his next book was uh, India and Asian uh, Geopolitics, the Past and Present. Uh, 2021, again by Brookings Institute Press. Uh, he can speak Chinese, he can speak German. He's also interested in classical music and the Himalayas. Uh, we couldn't have had a more eminent speaker to talk to us, uh, and his subject is going to be India in a world adrift. Uh, after uh, your talk, sir, we will have a question answer session that will be conducted by Dr. Manpri Sethi, Distinguished Fellow at Center of Air Power Studies. Uh, you are uh, uh, everybody is requested to put uh, your questions in the chat box. And uh, uh, as I hand over to you, Mr. Shiv Shankar Menon, kindly unmute yourself uh, and uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Marshal Chopra, for that well, very detailed and flattering introduction. Uh, I promise not to speak Chinese or German. I will, I am really honored to have been asked to speak in your eminent lecture series. Uh, I thought that I would speak about India in a world adrift, by which I mean a world between orders, and maybe discuss where we are today in terms of global geopolitics and the challenges that that poses to us in India and the opportunities that it creates, because it does both. Uh, so why do I say this is a world adrift? I think most observers would agree that the old order is gone, that 
but they disagree today when they describe when it happened and what has replaced it. Uh, the multiple candidates for the dates of when the old order collapsed was, I mean, there's 9-11, there's the global financial crisis of 2008, COVID pandemic starting 2020. Some people even think the Russian invasion of Ukraine this year marks a huge shift. And as for what replaced it, frankly, the buzzword today everyone uses, most governments use, is multipolar without a clear definition of what that means. I suppose the word flatters many medium or regional powers into thinking that they matter. After all, if there's many polls, then they can count themselves as one, and it enables politicians to tell their people that they matter. Uh, but my own view is that the world is actually not multipolar. It is today between orders. And frankly, if you look at the global response to the pandemic, to COVID, I mean, there was no unified response. The last time there was a unified, uh, concerted global response to a global challenge was really in April 2009 after the, the G20 summit in London, which re re responded to the global financial crisis, uh, shored up the international banking system, prevented another great depression like the one in the 30s. Uh, compared to that, look at the divided reactions to the Russian invasion of Ukraine now or to the pandemic. I'll return to the Ukraine uh, later. So the way I see it, the world order has gone through three phases, structural phases since World War II. First, of course, was the Cold War, which we all know was bipolar, a clash of ideologies and systems. And the world was really divided into two separate systems, which had very little to do with each other, the capitalist or free market system and the socialist system. They were not dependent on each other. They were not linked to each other. And ultimately, the capitalist system prevailed in the contest, both economically and politically and ultimately militarily as well. That was followed after the collapse of the Soviet Union with, by the unipolar movement where these were the globalization decades when neoliberalism, the Washington consensus held sway, when global supply chains were formed, when, uh, when the world was relatively open for goods and for capital, not for people. Uh, and ideas were still, IPRs were in fact much more strictly enforced than they had been before. Uh, but at least for goods and for capital, it was, it became one global economy. But now we are in a world adrift because uh, what we see now around us is a retreat from globalization, even by its sponsors. I mean, the, the US and others who started globalization, when they saw that its greatest beneficiaries were China and India in that order, uh, they have moved to a much more protectionist stance. Uh, and I think, but what the globalization decades did was to shift the balance of economic power in the world uh, very fundamentally. In 1980, something like 63% of global GDP was uh, accounted for by the OECD countries, by the West. Uh, but by 2016, that share was down to less than 50%. The US share stayed roughly the same, between 25 and 30% of global GDP right through these decades. Uh, but the ones who gained tremendously were China and India, who went from slightly less than 3% of global GDP. China went up to about 18% PVP terms. India went from, again, around 2.8, 2.9 to about 8% uh, about of global GDP. So uh, the real shift in power took place from Europe. Europe declined to less than, to around 19% of global GDP from originally having a bigger share even than the US for some years. Uh, and the balance of economic, the center of economic gravity of the world shifted towards Asia. This was the most dynamic part of the world. This was the part where global growth came from. 
And these were structural ch changes. The result was that those powers, especially the US, which previously had provided global public goods, whether it's security of sea lanes, whether it was their interventionist foreign policy that they followed to provide security, support for multilateral institutions, IMF, World Bank, the UN, and creation of WTO, which was the height of the globalization decades. All that support collapsed in the West, certainly, and there was a turning inwards. Uh, and so today you have a situation of limited US interest, but there's nobody who can actually replace the US because these fundamental changes in the balance of power in the world economy and internal politics which have occurred thanks to these changes uh, mean that the West today for the first time in two centuries accounts for less than half of global GDP. The internal politics of the great powers, certainly the Western powers, do not support their international ambitions. Uh, and we are therefore in a very confused state. Today, if you look at the world, it is economically multipolar because there's no question China is a global economic superpower. She matters in every market that counts and she has global reach in economic terms. But the world is still unipolar in military terms. There is only one power which can actually project military power across the globe wherever she wants, when she wants, and that's the US. China is still militarily a regional power. Uh, what she's trying to do is to break up the globalized military world, at least, into regional and to, but she's in a very crowded neighborhood. If you look at Northeast Asia, it's not just whatever China might have achieved, which is a great deal in terms of military modernization, uh, but she's surrounded in Northeast Asia by Russia, by North Korea, South Korea, Japan, and the US presence in Korea, in Japan, in the first island chain. I mean, these are not small adversaries. These are major military powers. Uh, so today I would therefore call the world economically multipolar, unipolar, but tending to regionalization militarily and politically thoroughly confused. Uh, there are, when people try and say free world versus autocracy or try these, or the Chinese scholars try and say it's a bipolar world with, with, between China and the US, it's not really true. I mean, China lacks the capacity, the US lacks the will today to provide global public goods. Uh, and we've seen this recently when Ukraine happened, for instance. Uh, so what characterizes this world? One is obviously the return of power politics, contention among the great powers. You can see all the flashpoints around us where in the center of gravity of world geopolitics, which is now the Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific, whatever you want to call it, all these flashpoints from the Senkaku Islands to Taiwan, to South China Sea, to the India-China border, these are all alive and hot. And they're a consequence of China's very rapid rise and the international systems pushback. For the US now, China is what they call the pacing challenge. The US now faces a, a near peer competitor in Northeast Asia. Uh, and so there is a return of power politics in the traditional sense. And you can see this in all these relationships, China, US, of course, US, Russia, but in multiple other examples, Japan, China, India, China, and so on. And even the consensus on nuclear proliferation is fraying in Northeast Asia and elsewhere. Secondly, we're seeing a fragmentation of the globalized world economy, a selective decoupling, and also the weaponization of economics, of, of everything, actually, if you look at how sanctions are being applied to Russia, how even SWIFT, just a payment system, a payments messaging system is being used as a weapon. China has done this for many years, whether it's with salmon exports from Norway or bananas from Philippines or Australian Bali, Canada, whenever somebody displeases her, she cuts off tourism 
to South Korea, for instance, when they accept TAD from the US. Third feature of this world between orders is the ineffectiveness of multilateral and international institutions. As I said, you saw the reaction to the pandemic. You've seen how we, what is presented as an international reaction to climate change is basically just a collection of individual commitments by countries, depending on what they're willing to do. Uh, and the fourth feature of this last decade and a half since the global financial crisis is really the rise of new authoritarians to power in most of the great powers uh, and their reliance on ultranationalism for their legitimacy, a turning inwards of domestic politics as their ability, you know, the high growth years of the globalization decades are over. And most of these economies are slowing or much slower than they were before. And as their ability to deliver goes down, their performance legitimacy declines. So they rely much more on rhetoric, on ultranationalism, on promises. I mean, the promises seem to grow in inverse proportion to their ability to actually deliver. But notice that all these predate the COVID pandemic, the Ukraine war, most other recent developments. They've all been accelerated by the pandemic, whether it is the return of power politics, the fragmentation of the globalized world economy, the ineffectiveness of international institutions, and the rise of the new authoritarians. And there is no going back to the earlier world. So there is not much point, I think, in trying and wishing that we go back to, or doing what we used to do in the past. So what are our challenges in this situation? Uh, India used the first two phases that I mentioned, the bipolar Cold War world and the globalization decades, quite successfully to concentrate on our primary task of developing and transforming India and of ensuring that there's sufficient security to the extent that we can and an enabling external environment for that development and transformation of India. And we didn't just cope uh, because the second phase actually saw our high, high growth years. The India you see around you would not exist if it were not for what was done in the first seven decades of the Republic. Just think of how different our lives are from those of our fathers and our grandfathers. Uh, indeed, by most metrics of power, India has improved her position against every other country except China, which did even better in the last 40 years. But today, this world adrift that I described faces us with a much more complicated environment for the transformation of India. And let me just run through what I see as our biggest challenges because of the nature of this world. One, of course, is China's rise. I mean, China's rise is a result of the globalization decades, the same decades that we benefited from, but they benefited even more, and they've used it to build a formidable power on our borders, a power with whom we have considerable friction. Uh, and there have been mounting signs of trouble in the relationship since about 2012 or so. A much stronger Chinese commitment to Pakistan, evidence since especially Xi Jinping's 2015 visit, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, $62 billion commitment. Also, China is now openly opposed to India's rise. Take the NSC membership issue. In 2008, China made it quite clear that she didn't like it but she would go along with the consensus. She wouldn't be the only one to oppose us. By 2015, when we applied for membership of the NSG, China actually stood up in public and said before the, it had even come up before the NSG, said in public that they didn't like the idea and that there should be criteria, meaning that Pakistan should also come in. So she's willing to be seen to be opposing India. And this is not something brand new. Uh, China's also played an increasing role in the subcontinent uh, in, and interfered in the internal politics of Nepal. She was instrumental in getting the Communist parties together and trying to keep them together, failed ultimately, but still involved. And in the internal politics of Sri Lanka, where she bet very heavily on the Rajapaksa family and made her preferences quite clear. Uh, and of course, China's military buildup and increasing presence in the Indian Ocean 
and her search for bases. She's already have established an official one in Djibouti, but she's also looking at Sihanoukville, at Guadalajivani, elsewhere, Mambantota, and so on. But the question is, why did India, China have 30 years of peace on the border, where the border stayed where it was, with both sides respecting the status quo until spring of 2020? And why did China change her behavior on the border in 2020? The obvious explanation, of course, is the balance of power shifted to their advantage. In 1988, when the basic understandings for Modus Vivendi were reached, that we would live and let live and respect the status quo. Uh, the Indian and Chinese economies were roughly the same size, similar technological levels, equal levels of integration into the world. But uh, now, if you look at it, the Chinese economy is much bigger than us, much more integrated into the world. In fact, a central part of most global supply chains and technologically also ahead of us. Uh, Besides, China has devoted much more effort to military reform and modernization and to building up her infrastructure on the border. But this explains how China could do what she did in the spring of 2020. It doesn't explain why she chose to do what she did. When she did, changing the status quo militarily in her own favor, breaking agreements that she had respected for decades and occupying areas on the Indian side of the LAC, preventing our army from patrolling where it had for years. For that explanation, frankly, we are speculating. I and mean, there is one way of explaining it is just the great leader's personality. I don't find that very satisfactory. For me, more likely is the compulsions of domestic Chinese politics. Chinese government was under considerable strain when COVID broke out. But, uh, but the more basic explanation that I would offer, it's only speculation, remember, uh, is that China responds to events depending on her perception of the balance of power. As the India-China gap grew over the last 30 years, she thought that she could then dominate and manage the border the way she wanted. And that gap has grown, but I don't think we should let it frighten us. The real difference between our economies in PPP terms is only 2.45 is to 1. I know everyone says it's five times our size, but it's not really in PPP terms. Uh, and what really matters is usable power on the border. Why was it peaceful for so many years before that? Because the balance on the ground is different from the overall balance or the overall GDP balance. And because we possess the ability to embarrass China but that's an ability that China must believe we are willing to exercise. Uh, and that is very important if we are to deter future Chinese actions like this. So China did what she did, I think, in spring 2020, because she felt the effective balance had shifted in her favor. She thought she could get away with it and would gain from a short, sharp military action against India. She learned the wrong lessons from Doklam. Uh, where she has basically occupied the rest of the plateau, except for the precise face-off point, and got away with it. Uh, she may have done some of this, what she did in the Western sector, for local military reasons, but I think the broader political reasons were probably what decided the leadership to show the U.S. that India is not a counterweight to China, uh, to show us, India, that we have to face China alone and sh so should come to terms with China and to show our neighbors, Bhutan, for instance, that they cannot rely on India for security against China. China concluded some years ago that India had gone over to the U.S. side and she may have also wanted to distract us from our maritime ambitions in the Indian Ocean region and the seas near China, pinning us down on the land border. But China didn't achieve, if these were her goals, she didn't achieve these goals entirely. And it now has doubled down on the standoff that she provoked. Uh, both sides talk of disengagement, but mean different things. And frankly, creating buffer zones and so on is not really a good solution to this problem. It might stop the chance of an accidental explosion or trouble 
conflict, but uh, it's not really a solution which prevents, which guarantees any kind of peace or tranquility in the future. Uh, and the amazing thing is that these two years are the years when India-China trade has boomed, where China has become again our number one trading partner, and traders set records in 2020, 2021. Uh, we do have some, therefore, economic leverage, even though the balance is tremendously against us. But my prescription, for what it's worth, is that we have to build strength, find partners, while engaging in a real strategic dialogue bilaterally to see whether we can evolve a new framework for the relationship. The one that was formulated in 88 during the Rajiv Gandhi visit, formalized, uh, frankly, that kept the peace and worked for 30 years, but clearly is no longer, longer works. And we need to see whether our core interests can be reconciled or the differences managed today in a new framework for the relationship. I'm not optimistic that we will find a new framework, but the attempt is worth making because the more we, India rises, the more we must expect Chinese opposition. And we will have to work with other powers much harder within the subcontinent to ensure that our own interests are protected in the neighborhood. And for me, the key is to rapidly accumulate usable and effective power, even while the big macro balance will take some time to, to right itself. But we must be ready for a much tougher relationship with China in, in coming times. The other big challenge is really the slowing and fragmenting world economy. Uh, we've seen how unpredictable energy costs. I mean, just the Ukraine war has driven energy costs, food prices, which luckily benefits us because we export food, food prices, fertilizer prices, which we import up through the roof. I don't think we realize how tied we are to the world economy. Uh, a little less than half of our GDP is actually the external sector. When you add trade in merchandise goods, imports plus exports, which, by the way, amount to, amounted to a trillion dollars last year. That's one third of your GDP. If you add to that remittances, you add to that services, you're actually getting very close to or almost half of your GDP is connected to the rest of the world. Your exports are dependent on imports because almost 40% of the value add in your, import, in your exports comes from imports and imported materials. So you are tied to the world in a sense that you have not, not been for the 70 years of, 70 plus years of independence. Uh, and the external environment is getting much tougher. The World Bank, the IMF estimate that something like 35 countries are at grave risk of defaulting on their debts, the international debts. And nine of them are already in debt crisis talks with them. Uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka are in that list of nine. Uh, and everyone's known this problem for the last four years, at least every G20 and so on, this is mentioned, but nothing has been done. Nobody has restructured their debt. None of the donors has written off debt. The world's reaction has been inaction. This is why I say we're between orders. This is hardly evidence of a functioning world order. Uh, and the prospect, therefore, is for a low growth world, which is much more driven by interstate, intrastate for conflict and violence. And we are, thanks to the state of the world economy and what's happening, at a hinge moment in the international economy. And there are several economic challenges which could affect our quest unless we handle them properly. Properly, energy security is one. Uh, we've uh, technology and the decoupling in technological fields that's happening and the increasing protectionism. And there's also other big changes such as revolutions in manufacturing and communications in energy technology. And we are watching a new economic order being formed around us. There are three big regional blocks, trading blocks, which are now exist, USMCA for North America, EU in, or the, in Europe, and RCEP led by China, which accounts for something like almost 40% of world's GDP. Uh, we are the only major economy which is not part of any of these. Uh, not part of any of these groups. And we need to adjust to these new economic realities. Uh, today, as I said, 
80% of our imports are maintenance imports, are things that we need just to run our lives. Uh, instead, what we've been doing is going the other way. We walked out of the RCP negotiations after eight years of negotiating. We've been raising our ag average tariff rates, which were already among the highest in the region, from 12 to above 18 percent, well above Southeast Asian, East Asian levels. And if we want to attract investors, if we want people to manufacture in India, all this deters them because they don't want to have to enter a block from the outside facing tariff and other barriers. They don't see. So, frankly, we are running the risk of cutting ourselves off from the world just when we need the world most and when we have a real chance to compete with China for the first time as a global manufacturing center. But we're making it harder for ourselves to integrate India into global supply chains, which we are not a big part of yet. We need to work with other parts to make sure that our region stays multipolar or plural and open. And frankly, that also to ensure that China behaves responsibly. And it's not easy to run a political defense security relationship with Southeast Asian countries, for instance, or with Japan without the economic leg to stand on or walk on. You can't have a one legged policy, which is only military defense, intelligence, politics, uh, even though no matter what they might feel about China's expansion. They're all like us, tied to them, tied to China economically. And so I think we need, therefore, to look at our economic engagement with the world in much in a strategic sense, rather than just, uh, just looking at it as how do we protect our industry? And frankly, we've seen what Autaki does, what import substitution does. I and mean, those were our worst years, the 60s and the 70s. Uh, thirdly, we see the Asia being reorganized. It's being reordered. China used the Belt and Road to try and consolidate her hold across Eurasia, the landmass. <coughs> and she's contending for supremacy in the near seas with the existing maritime order led by the US. Now, in the near seas, she faces contention, but frankly, across the landmass, so far, she was pushing at an open door because Russia was her partner, had been pushed into her arms by the West and the US and the smaller Central Asian and other countries, including East European and Central European countries, Greece, Hungary and so on, were more than happy to work with China. The Ukraine war has complicated BRI to a considerable extent and sort of reminded them that, you know, there are realities of security and war which will prevent. Uh, I don't, uh, in fact, if one big goal of Belt and Road was to connect Europe to China and China to Europe, uh, that now seems rather difficult. Going through Russia, a sanctioned Russia, which is isolated, uh, or through Ukraine, which is destroyed by the war and which where the war doesn't show any sign of ending quickly, even if it does, We've already seen 10 years of proxy war and it doesn't seem like that's going to stop. So for China, actually her world has been complicated. BRI at least has been complicated, but the West is absent on the continent. There is no US Western presence in central Eurasia uh, and especially after the withdrawal from Afghanistan. So we have to work with whoever we can find to work with, whether it's Russia, who's a traditional partner, whether it's Iran, uh, they're not that comfortable with this, with uh, Eurasia being consolidated under Chinese uh, auspices. Uh, but today they don't seem to have much choice but to work with the Chinese because they're not being offered any alternatives. And that is a question for us, whether we can offer them off-ramps and other alternatives, uh, which I think they would welcome. Uh, the, of course, US-China relations are going to drive what happens in Asia, but that seems now hard baked into a form of strategic competition. And certainly in the maritime domain, where the, the Chinese now, I think, are getting more and more 
uh, agitated about what they see as an offensive U.S. maritime strategy to contain China. What they originally used to call the Quad foam on the ocean, as though they could dismiss it. But now they're suddenly talking about it as a nation, NATO, and they're actually building it up into something much more. I think the real problem is, is with AUKUS, which uh, has uh, brought into question China's dominance of her near seas. These might be closed oceans and therefore to historical battle spaces. But uh, AUKUS would also bring into question her bastion strategy for uh, nuclear SLBMs. Uh, it's, it'll be interesting to see how, how this will play out. But that maritime contention is critical to our future because even the South China Sea, 38% of our trade flows through the South China Sea. So we have an interest at sea in ensuring that these sea lanes stay open and accessible to us all and they're not just dominated by any one power and and we have to balance that with the needs of our continental strategy uh, because our land borders remain challenged we have china but we also have pakistan which now has become a subset of our china problem in many ways so the quad and the indo-pacific uh actually is useful because it compensates for the sea blindness we used to display. But it's not the entire answer to all our security needs. Uh, and I think we need to therefore bear that in mind when we deal with issues. And that probably explains why we chose to respond the way we did when Ukraine happened. Uh, but the biggest challenge for us, quite frankly, because I don't think that there are any external existential threats to India. The biggest challenges to us are internal. Uh, because the external world may be getting more unpredictable, more uncertain. But internal security challenges are much more serious. In, in India, since the beginning of the century, all indices of violence have declined. Whether it's separatists, deaths, by terrorism, all of them, the secular trend is downwards, except two things, communal violence, which has been growing since 2012, and social violence or crimes against the person, which reflects the churn in our society. We are increasingly being urbanized, and I don't think we count all the migrant populations properly when we say that we are 35% urban, we're probably much closer to 50% then we admit. Uh, but basically what we're seeing in this churn and this very rapid social change is that large numbers of people are being uprooted from social family base. They're alone, alienated in cities, open to new ideologies, impulses. And now with the ICT, they can see in their phone, on the, in the palm of their hands, they can see what is available in the world. And politics therefore becomes a matter of mass or mob psychology. And the politics of emotion replace the politics of reason. Politics were always emotional. I mean, I'm not saying it was ever pure reason. But this is a trend that's not only true of India, it's true of China, it's true of the US, you see it across. It's a global issue, what urbanization, globalization have done to domestic politics. Uh, but that is very important uh, because we really need an internal cohesion if we are to deal with this much more uncertain world. Uh, I will not try and tell an audience like this about the changing face of war and what the military lessons from Ukraine, for instance, are about the effectiveness of conscript armies, of performance of bat battalion tactical groups, drones, et cetera, et cetera, control of the spectrum, of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, there's as much a war of narratives as there is an actual war on the ground in Ukraine. The West is clearly winning the war of narratives. But I would like to make a couple of political points of what we see and what it reflects of the world around us. Uh, it's We are in a world where the strong do what they will and the weak do what they must. A world without institutional protection for states from one another, where power determines outcomes. 
and this competition for security and power drives international relations. I mean, there's, I think there's no question. And what the Ukraine also shows is the pervasive role of commitment problems. Uh, look what happened to the security assurances to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity contained in the Budapest Memorandum of 5th December 1994, where the US, Russia, and the UK signed and affirmed that they would protect Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty in return for Ukraine giving up her 2,000 plus nuclear weapons, which she did. I mean, it's obviously a worthless piece of paper today. Russia herself has invaded Ukraine. Uh, everybody else is ready to fight to the last Ukrainian, but not sending troops themselves. Uh, and you can see the effect, the ripple effect of this kind of commitment problem. Abe say, speaks in Japan immediately after the Russian invasion of the need for Japan to consider nuclear weapons. Prime Minister Kishida, of course, immediately squashes it. The fact is that the longest serving former Prime Minister of Japan is willing to say this in public about nuclear weapons. And 66% of South Koreans are saying today that if North Korea has nuclear weapons, they must have nuclear weapons too. North Korea is not giving up her weapons after seeing what's happened in Ukraine. I mean, it's only the last in a series from Libya onwards, which will guarantee that Kim Jong-un is not going to give up his weapons. In which case, someday South Korea will. And then do you think with the nuclear armed Russia, China, North Korea, South Korea, Japan can sit alone in Northeast Asia without weapons? So for me, the logic of what's happening is actually, and of this world adrift, is actually changing the stakes and the calculus in uh, uh, in on issues like nuclear proliferation, where the regime seemed relatively stable until a few years ago. Uh, it's the same thing about extended deterrence. Why would the U.S. she might offer a nuclear umbrella, but will she put San Francisco and New York at risk in order to defend Seoul or Tokyo? It's hard to believe. So. Uh, so there are issues now about the credibility of nuclear deterrence and so on. Uh, the other thing, of course, that Ukraine proves is, is how large a role misperception seems to play, but I don't think we have time to get into that. But what are the opportunities then for us? I see at least five big opportunities for us. This is a time of fundamental phase transformation in the international system. Uh, thanks to technology, energy revolution, digital manufacturing, AI, other changes. This will change not just global economics, but politics as well. Uh, frankly, it's a time of rulemaking, of new standards, new norms being negotiated. And now is the time for us to be engaged and to be present at the creation, as it were. We are an alternative to China already in several respects, and competitiveness is the key, which is being killed by our own protective inst instincts, by bu Indian businesses' protectionist instincts, which the political leadership buys into. And we have to make basic choices here, but there is an opportunity. You've seen how our exports have boomed over the last year uh, because they, they need alternate suppliers. Uh, we also have an opportunity in the neighborhood, in the subcontinent. We are taking that opportunity today in Sri Lanka. If you notice the government of India's statements and quick response in providing credit lines and ensuring that food and basic supplies reach Sri Lanka and not choosing political sides, not saying, not, not even mentioning the government of Sri Lanka in its public statements by the MEA spokesman the other day, uh, staying out of their internal politics, but being a good neighbor. Uh, I think that's the kind, what we need to do, you know, there's this general feeling that our influence in the neighborhood is declining. What we need to do is to step up our, our game because other people are very active, not just China, but we need to actually be seen as a security provider, which is what we have done successfully over the last 15 years with Bangladesh and transformed that relationship. We need to be seen as a source of prosperity. 
and be seen as a stabilizer in their internal and external politics. And we have several affinities and advantages in the neighborhood which we can use and we should use. Uh, because if we need, if we are to enjoy peace at home, to develop, then we need to consolidate this periphery of ours and make sure that it cannot be used against us. And today, every major power except China defers to India's preferences in the Indian subcontinent. And our means to cope with that situation have grown exponentially, and we should learn to use them. Uh, the other opportunity that I want to mention as a possibility still, if you look at the world's reaction to the Ukraine thing, nobody wanted to have to choose, well, forget the West, forget Western Europe, who is a direct actor, and the US. But outside that, in Asia, only three countries impose sanctions on Russia, Japan, South Korea, and if you count Australia as Asian, uh, nobody else did. And the reason was quite simple, because they don't want to be forced into these choices between China and the US or between Russia and the West. Uh, even we don't. I mean, for us, Russia is a desirable partner. West is an essential partner, but that doesn't mean we still choose the West entirely. And we've been very careful in what we've done. Uh, so there is space there, which if we work with others, I think, with other middle powers and others who share our approach, I think we can develop a broader, not just developing country, but a middle power sort of coalition on certain issues. We, this is a non-ideological world. And my own answer to this problem is that we should form issue-based coalitions of the willing and able on issues that are of our concern. We've done that on maritime security. You'll have a different set of partners for something else, whether it's cybersecurity or counterterrorism or nonproliferation or energy security. Each one you would need different sets of people to work with. Lastly, as I said, because it's a phase of fundamental phase transformation in the international system, uh, due to the effects of technology, a large number of them, I think we need to study this link between war and technology, as you do in CAPS, uh, very, very carefully. You know, we live in an age which is dazzled by technology. But interestingly, the overwhelming majority of wars since World War II have been won by the technologically inferior side. Uh, what we're seeing in the Ukraine suggests to me at least that the basic level lessons of 1971, of Vietnam, of Afghanistan must never be forgotten. That war is political, that the people are still essential for successful war conduct and termination, and that it's a combination of men, ideas, technology, and weapons that matter. Uh, but as I said, I... I don't have the answers, you know them much better, and I'd be very happy to hear what you think we should be doing to cope with this world. Uh, in conclusion, I'll just leave you with a paradox. We need the world to transform ourselves, but at the same time, we cannot expect the world to solve our problems, particularly those relating to the defense of India. There's no other country which shares our interests fully, or which is at our stage of development with a similar history, geography, we are a subcontinent. We're part of a large continent, but we're also a world unto ourselves. By the way, this is the only subcontinent on Earth. Uh, we will therefore have to tread our own path and probably make it as we go, building our own strength, working with the partners where our interests coincide. And that's why, to my mind at least, strategic autonomy is the only choice for India. I'll stop there and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. What a lovely and uh, you know comprehensive tour the horizon of where the world today is. I've lost your sound. Uh, uh, Manpreet, your audio is. Uh... Gone. Okay, uh, till uh, Manpreet comes back, I will uh, 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 stand in her.